Hi, Al Williams with Hackaday here. Last time, we did a Verilog design using EDA Playground with the idea that we would put it onto a lattice semiconductor ice stick FPGA board. Now, we had a lot to cover last time, so the only part I put in was a combinatorial circuit that was basically a 2-bit binary adder. So it just adds up 2 bits, gives you a sum and a carry. And that's fine. Even the most powerful computer in the world's probably got a bunch of adders somewhere down inside of it. But the bulk of modern digital design uses more sequential circuits, and we'll talk about why that is. And by a sequential circuit, I mean circuits with a clock. Sometimes you hear it called a synchronous circuit. And flip-flops, one or more flip-flops. So flip-flops like a piece of memory, right? Like a one-bit binary memory. And as that implies, that gives your designs the ability to remember things like a previous state or a current count. And that's pretty important if you want to do pretty much anything. But there's another reason flip-flops are very important to digital design, and that's to equalize delays. So if you didn't have a flip-flop in your circuit and you just had a bunch of combinatorial gates, anything really complex would require you to manage all these different inputs arriving at slightly different times. Or you would have to somehow equalize it so that they all arrived at the same time when they changed. That would be really, really difficult. So instead, we tend to build circuits as a bunch of flip-flops with a little bit of combinatorial logic in between the flip-flops. There's a clock running on the ice stick. There's a 12 megahertz clock. If you don't change anything, you get 12 megahertz. And so as long as all your combinatorial circuits have settled down before the next 12 megahertz pulse, then you don't have any problems. It doesn't matter if some of them finish a little bit earlier than some other ones as long as the latest one fits inside that 12 megahertz period. So that's why you really want flip-flops in your designs because not having them would make it really hard to remember things and make it really tough to design. So if you recall on the right hand side here under design SV that's actually the test design and then there's the test bench, the driver for simulation over here in the left. I had to make changes to both of those. The most obvious change here in the demo module is I've got a clock input and I also have a reset input and I also have a run stop input that I forgot to put a comment on there for. So when that goes high the counters will stop. I'm not actually going to drive that but I wanted to show you how that works and the reset will cause all these memories, these flip-flops, to reset themselves. Okay, we'll also put some counters in. Here's a 16-bit rig. Remember, the rig's like a variable. So we're going to have a 16-bit rig, 0 to 15. 15 is the most significant bit, 0 is the least, called counter 1 or CNT1. We'll have a 7-bit CNT2. We'll have a 2-bit deck counter. And we'll have a half-sec pulse. And you can guess that's going to give me a half-second pulse. I'm going to count down that 12 megahertz clock to get to a half-second pulse so I can blink some LEDs because what kind of demo doesn't have blinking LEDs? My run stop and reset, I'm going to alias those just like I did for the inputs for the adder. So PMOD 3 and PMOD 4 become run stop and reset. So that's pretty much the same as before. And then I've got this rig carry latch. That's going to be the first flip-flop we're going to deal with. And what it's going to do is it's going to remember the state of this carry. So if the carry gets set, carry latch is going to get set, and it's going to stay set even if carry doesn't stay set. So if we've ever had a carry, that carry latch will be true, and it'll be true until we reset the FPGA, or at least reset the circuit. Don't necessarily have to reset the whole FPGA. Now that rig I mentioned was like a variable, so you might think, aha, that's how you do a flip-flop, is you just call it a rig. Well, not exactly. That's the good start, but there's more to it that we have to do to get a flip-flop to infer out of this one variable. And it's not sufficient to just have the variable. We can use rigs all over the place, and it's not necessarily going to give you a flip-flop. So the rest of this is the same as it was last time, with the exception of I drove LED3 with carry latch. And so let's look at what causes that flip-flop to be instantiated. It's this code I've just highlighted here. We've got this always block, and we say always at pause edge of the clock. That's just what it sounds like. When the clock goes from 0 to 1, that edge is where all this stuff's going to happen in here. And it's not going to happen any other time. 
the Verilog compiler is going to look at the reset line, and if it's true, it will set carry latch to zero. Remember, one apostrophe B zero is just a one-bit binary zero, or one-bit binary one over here in this case. The carry latch will get reset by that. If the reset is not true, then we hit this else side, and it'll look at the carry. And if the carry's true, carry latch will get set to 1. We're using non-blocking assignments here. We talked about those last time. So the only way to change carry latch is either you get a reset or a carry, and only at the positive edge of the clock. Any other time, carry latch will not change its value. So if you get a positive edge of a clock, you're not in reset, and carry's not set, nothing happens. Carry latch stays the same. So that's a, basically a flip-flop. It'll infer a flip-flop, and in fact, it's going to look at that and kind of match it to a template, and it's going to say, hmm, I see you're looking at the reset only inside the clock, so I'm going to generate a flip-flop with a synchronous reset. And there are flip-flops with asynchronous resets, and there's a way to write that as well. In this particular case, it didn't matter much, but depending on your application and depending on your FPGA, the actual fabric, the cells that it provides to make up flip-flops and things like that, there might be some advantage or disadvantage to doing a synchronous or an asynchronous flip-flop. That's a little out of scope for this series, but I just wanted to point that out to you, that this is a synchronous reset flip-flop. Our 12 megahertz clock is obviously too fast to blink an LED for mere mortals to see. And there's a little bit of a second problem in here. Let me first tell you how we're going to do it at runtime. We're going to count that 16-bit counter all the way around. So we're going to get 65,000 plus counts. And that will roll over about every 5.5 milliseconds. And then on the second counter, when it rolls over, we're going to bump that second counter and we're going to drive it to 91. And that's going to give us right at a half second. You'll be able to see this graphically here in just a minute. The only problem is, is on the simulation, running through 65,000 counts to get to the 5 millisecond mark, 5.5 millisecond mark, that's going to be a really long simulation with a lot of data to wade through. And so it's pretty common when you're doing simulations like this to change some of these values so that it doesn't take as long in simulation. And then you just have to remember to put them back when you're done and you're ready to program the FPGA. There's some fancy ways of doing that, but I did it with just comments just to keep it simple for the, the illustration of this video. So let's look at this counter and see what we're doing. We've got always at pause edge clock, just like the earlier flip-flop, so we're still controlled by the clock. And we've got a very similar thing here. If the reset's equal to 1, we're going to set up our counters to all be 0, all the different pieces that we had, counter 1, counter 2, the deck counter, and the half second pulse. We're going to set them all to 0. Then if that's not the case, that we're in reset, we're going to look at run stop. And if it's not set, set being stopped, then we're going to go ahead and do the rest of the stuff. And you can see I've got my comments in here. Normally I would have put counter 1 is counter 1 plus 1. And then a little bit later I would have said, well, if counter 1 is 0, then let's go ahead and check to see if counter 2 is 91. And then we would set counter 2 to 0 and, and roll it over. Otherwise, we're going to make counter 2 to 1. But if you look, it's kind of confusing because of the way I have the comments here. But if you look, I've commented those out. And in, in this case, I'm going to add 8,000 hex. This is a 16-bit hex number. I don't have a B here. I have an H. That's hex. And so that means... I'm going to get 8,000, then I'm going to go to 0, 8,000, 0. So essentially I'm going to change this to a divide by 2 counter instead of a divide by 65,000 counter. And if the counter is 0, I'm going to look to see if my other counter has rolled over. Well, I'm going to roll it over at 2 this time instead of 91 because I don't want to wait for it in simulation. If it's 2, I'm going to set it to 0. I'm going to set my half second pulse on. And if it's not 2, then I'll just add 1 to it. And normally that would have been 91, but in the simulation it's going to be 2. And then the half-second pulse will get reset in other cases. So you'll see that half-second pulse will just come and go in one clock cycle. And then the deck counter counts up for the half-second pulse. And we'll actually use that to drive the LEDs. And you can see that down here with the assign. Assign LED 4 is if deck counter 2 is set and then deck counter 0 will drive LED 5. So that'll be really clear on the 
waveform that we look at after simulation, how those are going to blink together and what the pattern will be. Now over here in the test bench, we had to make similar changes. We've got extra stimulus, we've got run, stop, reset, and of course we've got the clock. And then that has to be put into the instantiation of the device under test. So there's a clock, there's the run, stop, there's the reset. All the rest of it's fairly similar. We've initialized those stimulus variables. We start the reset out as one because we want to reset. And it's really important to get that reset simulation in there because what's going to happen, Verilog, especially at simulation time, it knows that bits can be zero and one, of course, but it also knows they can be other things like high impedance or I don't know. And at the point where we don't have a reset setting these things up, it's going to say, well, that values I don't know, and I don't know and something else is also I don't know, you know, and so you, you get, you start getting these I don't knows all through your code, uh, all through your simulation result if you don't do the initialization. So we're going to hold it and reset for 10 cycles, and then we're going to tell it to go ahead and, and release the reset. And the rest of it's pretty much as it was before, except I want to give those counters time to exercise, so instead of delaying just 4 cycles here, I'm delaying 400. So we're going to have a much longer simulation this time. The clock generation is really important too because I've got the clock as zero here. And naively you would think, well, okay, I'll have to say now clock's equal to one and I'll do some things and now clock's equal to zero and I'll do some things and now clock's equal to one again. That would be really, really tedious. So instead, I've got the clock generator down here. It uses an always block. It's not tied to a clock edge or some variables. So it's just going to, it literally is always, it's always going to do this. There's a delay of one, and I've got clock is equal to the inverse of the clock. So if the clock was zero, it becomes one. If the clock was one, it becomes zero. And again, very important that the clock was initialized here, because if the clock wasn't initialized, it would say, well, the invert of I don't know is still I don't know. And we'll, we'll see a little example of that here when we look at the simulation. So pretty simple changes to the test bench here. I'm going to save my work. All the settings over here are the same as in the first video. And I'm going to make a run at the simulation, see if we get any errors. And we don't. This design doesn't have a lot of signals, so I'm just going to be lazy and I'm going to get them all. Now you see the red areas here? That's the I don't know. I don't know what LED 3, LED 4, LED 5, carry latch, and half second pulse are. And I'm going to expand that up a little bit. Scroll over a little bit. You can see this is a lot more data than we had in the last simulation. So you can see those red areas there are basically saying, I don't know what that is yet. And of course, when does it know? The reset's high. And the clock goes to a positive edge. That's the positive edge of the clock right there. And suddenly all those things went to some known state because we did the initialization on the reset. And you can also see the counters. Instead of showing a red because they're multi-bit, it shows X, 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 and X there. They all went to zero also. So that's the reset starting right there. The adder shouldn't change any. But you'll see that the carry bit, when it goes up, like it did before, this carry latch line goes up on the next clock cycle. So look at that. This goes up here, and on the very next clock edge, that's where we latched that output. Now keep in mind, the adder itself is not beholden to the clock because it's combinatorial, but this flip-flop is. So you can see there's some delay in here from where the result was available and we didn't actually latch it until the rising edge. And then if you look at the counters, the counters are counting just like we thought they would. 8,000, 0, 8,000, 0. Counter 2 is running that way. And if you look, I'm going to zoom this back out a little bit so you can see the pattern. If you look at LED 4 and 5 here, you can see the pattern. This one's going to blink for half second, longer gap, half second. This one's going to blink every half second period there. So half second, half second, half second. And if you go back to the code, you'll recall that was with deck counter equal 2 driving LED 4 and deck counter 0 
driving LED5. So that pattern's not very surprising. In fact, it's exactly what we expect. So you could have left all the real numbers in there and generated a much longer simulation and, and actually seen it work out. There's a way to tell the simulator what each time tick really represents. I just left it at the defaults here, which was one nanosecond with one nanosecond precision. Uh, I'm not going to cover that here, but you could in fact tell it that you had a 12 megahertz clock and then go over here and count up cycles and come up with actual times. In this particular case, I didn't think that was very important because I knew I was going to go ahead and shortcut the actual count numbers and things like that to make the simulation more manageable. But at this point, the design looks like it works pretty well. We're getting correct addition. We're latching the carry. The LEDs are blinking the way we think they are. So I think we're about ready to go into the hardware. Now, when we go into the hardware, we're not going to use ED, uh, EDA Playground anymore. We'll have to use some tools. We're going to use the Ice Storm tools, which are open source toolkit that targets the ice stick. And we'll have to switch to a command line, and, and we'll, I've got some scripts that will help with that. Uh, but the biggest question that probably should be in your mind is, how do we get these LEDs and these PMOD things to actually map to the board? So in other words, the FPGA's got lots and lots of I.O. pins. What tells the compiler that this is pin number, you know, X, whatever X is, whatever the LED1 is actually connected to? If you didn't already have a PC board, you could theoretically go backwards, as let the tool pick whatever pins it wants, and then go design the board around it. Once you've got a board designed, you know, you pretty much have to restrain those things. And we'll talk about that next time. The name is part of it, but it's not sufficient just to have the name. Uh, I picked those names because I had defined those names to be pins, but that's not an inherent feature of Verilog, and we'll talk about how that works next time. So meanwhile, if you've got an ice stick board, you're just about ready to go put this code in. You don't forget to take the comments out to get the real values instead of the simulation values in, and uh, we'll look forward to you tuning in next time, and we'll program the board. Thanks for watching.